Hi, I'm a higher ed CMO and I have a confession to make. When you're a CMO, so much of your time is spent doing things that aren't creating. And if I could just pick any part of the career that I would be interested in just doing, it would be managing social media, to be honest with you, which I have been, had as a part of my portfolio since about 2008 doing work in social media. I just think it lets you flex so many muscles, strategy, um, tactics, design. It just gives you this really rich experience. And there is absolutely no one in the world that I admire more when it comes to social media than Jenny Lynn Fowler. And so having her enthusiastically agree to come on the show was just so awesome for me. And I hope you enjoyed this conversation with her. Welcome to Confessions of a Higher Ed CMO, a podcast that empowers higher ed marketers to bring innovation, creativity, and excellence to their work. I'm your host, Jamie Hunt. Join me every two weeks for discussions with some of the best minds in higher education marketing. Confessions of a Higher Ed CMO is part of the Nullify Network, a robust collection of podcasts designed to help higher educational professionals like you grow. Explore our other shows at enrollify.org or check out some of my personal favorites linked in the show notes below. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the leading AI-powered all-in-one student engagement platform, helping institutions create meaningful, personalized, and engaging interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com. I'm overjoyed to be here with Jenny Lee Fowler, who's the Director of Social Media Strategy at MIT. Hi, Jenny. How are you? Hi, Jamie. I'm so thrilled to be here. I am overjoyed to have you on the show. And your book, which is what we're going to be talking about around social media strategy, is just, I cannot think of anybody better to write this book. So oh, I'm say, super oh, excited you. to talk with you about it. Thank you. And I should probably mention to the listeners what it is because they can't see me waving it around by the camera. <laughs> so Jenny is the author of the newly released Organic Social Media, How to Build Flourishing Online Communities. And we're going to be chatting about that a little bit today. But first, Jenny, tell us a little bit about your career journey. Yeah, sure. So I um, started out as a TV reporter and anchor. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, I, I thought, yeah, I was um, working at a local NBC affiliate in central Illinois. Um, I thought I was going to die on the anchor desk. I thought that was the only thing that I was going to do. But, you know, like you, your priorities change, right? Mm -hmm. You change. The business was changing on me and how the business was conducted. And so, you know, I did, did a little soul searching. Um, I left and you know, within the market that I was working in, there was a Fortune 50 company that was headquartered there and they were launching an internal newscast that they wanted someone to anchor and produce. And oh, so cool. it was like, it was like a match made in heaven, right? It was like such a, a, a good fit. And it was like sort of my in into a business where like I had no other skills, like a dang <laughs> like that's all I did. So I was I was just lucky um that I stumbled upon this. But they also made me a web editor of like a web page, just one web page in their like broad digital um, you know, expansive properties. And so that led me to like start blogging. It made you know, led me to learn about CMS and SEO and just like comments and just social. Um, and I really learned a lot. I just, I just dug in and learned everything that I could learn about, you know, content management, content strategy, digital strategy. And that sort of led me to a job and a position at Harvard Kennedy School, where I was the web editor and social media manager. And um, social media just kept on taking more and more and more of my job like it does. I was just going to say. <laughs> yes. And then I thought, you know, if I can make this 100% of my job, I, I, don't, I think I would like that. I think that's my next step. And then the position opened at MIT and there's a colleague of mine that I knew that said, you know, this position opened up and I think that you're great for it and you should apply. And so I 
yeah, so that's how I got in. It was the manager position then. And since then I, you know, had been promoted to director and I'm still there. That's <laughs> they, awesome. How long so have you I been at they MIT? still like me um, uh, since 2015. So it's oh, like wow. going on eight years. Wow. I know it flies by. And I bet social media has changed so much in those years. So much. I mean, there's, there are platforms that we were using that don't exist anymore. Right. <laughs> right. Like, you know, RIP Google Plus and, right. you know, oh, and, yeah. and, and Lemur and, you know, there's, there's so many. Yeah. Well, and when I started working in social media, so I didn't, I've never had social media as a title, but it's been part of my responsibility since about 2008, 2009. And it was like, the wild west right like twitter was like you just post it like there was no <laughs> like there was no 100%. guidance you just did it <laughs> it was and now i feel like there's like the algorithm is much more complicated and there's a lot of different expectations from end users and I mean, I, I feel like it's a little bit of the Wild West still, but I think as social media professionals, we've gotten more sophisticated mm -hmm. in our use and how we think about it and how we plan and um, organize, you know, our goals. And so I, I think it, it, it's a real industry now. But yeah, there's, you know, you'll find, you'll find crazy stuff on the, on the internet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, when I think about 2008, it's kind of like how I think about AI now. It was like you're just sort of feeling your way through it. You don't have a track record of what works and what doesn't at first. And now, like, social media has been around for decades at this point. Yeah, and yeah. It's like almost a quarter of a century now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and and we've learned some things. It's no more like give it to your intern because they get the – no. <laughs> Please no, <laughs> no. It, it, I mean, it's like I said, it's become more sophisticated. Um, there, it, there's a lot of thought that goes into it that takes that takes experience and decision making and um, and uh, observations that you know. Um, I'm I'm and I'm not saying a young person can't do this. I'm just saying it just takes it takes time. Yeah. You know, it just takes some years being a professional to recognize and, and to utilize it like the tool that you can 100%. Well, I suppose it's, if you think about it, and I feel like this is something that some marketing leaders and some institutional leaders don't think about, but it's sort of like you wouldn't have a brand new graduate be making media relations pitches to the New York Times the day after they graduate, right? They haven't built the relationships. They don't necessarily know the best strategy for crafting a pitch. They don't necessarily know, you know, how do you target a reporter? How do you identify who the right reporter is yet? You get that over time with experience. So I would think that likewise, you wouldn't just throw somebody into and say, now manage this community with no experience with it. I love that. Um, like is an analogy or um, a comparison. Yeah. I, I love that comparison because, you know, th there's a lot of things can, that can go wrong too. Yeah. And, um, and a lot of crises unfold in social as well. And, you know, you, you don't want an inexperienced or um, a too much of a reactive person it takes a team. It takes um, a, a certain level of maturity to to know how to just kind of pause in that moment and recognize a moment and bring in people that you need, the right minds, the right voices. So yes, I think that is a really, really good comparison. Yeah. I hope that helps somebody who's listening, who's like, it's just posting on social. I do that all the time with my kids' first day of school pictures. And I think about the times when social has been so hard, like during the pandemic, when everybody was mad, whatever you did, 50% thought it was too much and 50% thought it was not enough. And after the, the George Floyd situation in 2020, I know that our social media staff were just like completely attacked by followers and told to kill themselves, told, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it's like, you can't just throw somebody into that without the proper background and, and training to be able to thrive in that environment or at least survive it. 
Yes, you're totally right. It's so in in delicate, sensitive situations, it's so easy to get wrong. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many ways that you can get that that you can trip or not get it right. Um and it is a place, you know, that it takes um you know, it takes time for you to realize that if you, you know, if you're not gonna if you don't feel like you can get it right, it's better not to say anything at all. Yeah. Like just don't don't like stay in your lane, you know, yeah. and don't, you know, step out of it just to step in it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Do you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's just, I think it just takes some recognition of, um, you know, like this sensitivity, nuance, yes. um, understanding of the temperature of the room, yeah. um, you know, what, what the internet, the mood of the internet, what, you know, it all, it's all comes into consideration when you're making crisis related difficult decisions when it has to do with social. And I feel like social media uh, teams have the their finger on the pulse of what's happening. Like the, I don't know if there's anybody, maybe some folks in student affairs, but who has a have a better sense of what is happening on campus. What's the vibe on campus? What are students talking about? What are they upset about? What are alumni excited about, upset about all of that. Yeah, I agree because they're listening, you know, which mm -hmm. is a really, really impo uh, important component of social media is that you're listening, you're monitoring your community, your audience, you know, it, and you, it's an instant feedback loop. I think that's what sometimes I'm amazed that people don't realize this, you know, you launch something or how about this? Say you air a commercial during the Super Bowl, and even then, it takes, I mean, you know, media, it it takes you like 24 hours or, you know, so the next news cycle for people to write about the uh, the Super Bowl ads, but people on, you know, Twitter X, you know, or Instagram, they'll tell you immediately what they think about that <laughs> yes. Super Bowl ad, right? It is an instant feedback loop where people will, you can learn what they like, what they don't like, and that it's invaluable because you're getting that for free. You're not, you know, you're not paying a focus group. You're not paying a marketing group. These are, this is the general audience. This is your community. Um, and they'll immediately tell you what they think. And, and it's invaluable if if you use that to inform future content and future decisions, it's priceless. Hey all, I hope you're enjoying this episode of Confessions of a Higher Ed CMO. I want to take a moment to thank my friends at MindPower who are making season two of this Involify podcast possible. MindPower is a full service marketing and branding firm celebrating nearly 30 years of needle moving, thought provoking, research fueled creative and strategy. MindPower is woman-founded and owned, WBENC certified, nationally recognized, and serves the social sector, higher education, healthcare, nonprofits, and more. The MindPower team is made up of strategists, storytellers, and experienced creators. From market research to brand campaigns to recruitment to fundraising, the agency exists to empower clients, amplify brands, and help institutions find a strategic way forward. You can learn more about their work in the world by heading on over to Mind Power Inc. That's M I N D P O W E R I N C dot com. And be sure to tell the crew that Jamie sent you their way. It's raw and it's real because they have no reason to pull their punches or like read what your body language is giving off like they might in a focus group. I mean, I know when we do focus groups, we try to be as neutral as possible, but you know, that's. I think is completely impossible to be totally neutral. So you're getting that. And and when you talked about like Super Bowl ads, I was just thinking about, do you remember Left Shark? Like the Katy yes. Perry yes. Super Bowl. And it yes. was like Left Shark became a meme within like 15 seconds of the performance. Yeah. And yeah, I'm, I love Left Shark. <laughs> I think Left Shark. Uh, is yes. Awesome. I, I'm here for Left Shark energy any day. But that's the whole thing is that, you know, what one thing I love about social media is that the things that you had that those sort of funny thoughts that you had at home, you yes. know, like, oh my gosh, like Left Shark is really going at it. You post it and you realize there's so many other people that are thinking <laughs> the same thing, right? And yeah. that's like a that's a commonality. And um and then all of a sudden it, it you realize, 
oh gosh, like, you know, I've shared this thought with so many other people and that sort of becomes a community, you know, yeah. and, and just in the sense that like your, your fans are out there. The people that like your brand are out there. And so, you know, the difference with between just getting a following or like engaging your community is that they're, they're your existing fans. They're the people who already really love you, you know? Yeah. And so they, and, and the experience for them when they get together is the same, like, like a flourishing community, it should be the same in person or online, you know? Um, and so they, it's just another venue or another place where they can share their love of your brand or your product or your organization, you know, in another another like platform. I love it. I love it. And I've been a fan of yours for a long time. I've been following oh, you on stop, Twitter for Jamie. a long time. I've been following you too. <laughs> I know this was a long co time coming. It took too long. <laughs> well, and I'm like, okay, so I'm, I'm, I thought you were too cool to come on my podcast. I'm just going to be honest. I was like, she's, she'll never say yes. No, say wait, yes. <laughs> no. When you asked me, I think I, I think I like I answered immediately. You did, I was nice. so excited. Yes. I was so excited. I answered immediately. I was so glad. I was like, okay, I'm just going to put it out there because Jenny's so cool. Uh, um, I'm just no. going to put it out there. So I'm so glad to have you here. <laughs> I'm so um, glad to be here. So your book, which I, I got the physical copy and Y'all, if you like a soft touch book, just buy it for that alone because <laughs> it is so soft, um, but it's fabulous. But what inspired you to write this? Like this is this is like a whole lot of effort to create. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, it is. Um, I, you know, I heard, I was hearing and reading a lot of people say and write like, you know, organic social media is dead, you know, mm. and, and I felt like I was the only voice out there that said, it's not dead. It's just difficult. <laughs> it just takes a lot of effort, but it's not, it's definitely doable right? And repeatable. Um, so I think that there was just a need for it in the market. There are so many books out there about paid social and paid social marketing strategy. How did you paid social, right? So I just think that there was a need. And so I guess I thought it was, I could fill it. <laughs> I love that you did. How long did it take you to write this? Like, again, meter or listeners, you can't see the size of this book, but this is this is not a, a slim edition. Like, it, this it's a book. Yeah, yeah, honestly, Jamie, when I got the copy myself and I held it, I was like, "This is thicker than I expected." <laughs> it's like a real book. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know it. Is. Um, so it's you know when you get started, the publisher especially when you're a first time author, the publisher has done this like time and time again. So they know they, I got so much guidance. They just mm. guide you. And because it's not a novel, right? It's not like I'm, I'm sitting in, and I, it's not like I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how people do that. Like I'm not writing the story with like intricate characters. It's, it's sort of like a knowledge transfer. Mm. It's, it's like a brain dump, just like an organized, well-organized brain dump. So they like go through all of this stuff with you, like, you know, like outline and dates and, you know, they're like, don't linger too long on chapters because you you can get inside your own head, you yeah. know, um, and, and then you can kind of sabotage yourself and then, you know, it gets, it might get too wordy. They kept me on a strict schedule that they, you know, that was tried and true and they knew. Um, and it took me about eight months oh, to wow. write it. So that was like sort of the draft and then you do editing and, you know, things like that. But, um, but it was within a year okay. it was, it was done. Right. So it's analogous to having a baby, like a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when you, you, when you hear people talk about like their book being their baby, I, I, I get it. I yeah. get it. It takes a toll too, because, and I didn't, I totally didn't expect this but you know you're you're at your desk working i mean now everything's on you know a laptop and i was writing on my laptop so you'd work and then i'd write at night and it was you know i'd be at my computer for 12 14 hours and Ugh. i already have like carpal tunnel syndrome oh. so it got really bad you don't think about this but it really takes a physical toll but it, 
I mean, you know, it's, it's only, it's only a short time. That's what I kept yeah. on telling myself is that, you know, just for this year, this is a priority. It's okay. Like dishes won't get done. It's okay. If I don't get to the gym, like this is just my focus um, for now. And when, you know, when you give it a hundred percent, like you're, I, you know, you can't help, but no, I poured everything that I have into it. And then, then you can feel good about it. Right. It really comes through. The book is, at, like she said, it's a, it's like a brain dump, but in a way that's super easy to digest. And it's broken up really well. So you could be like, I'm going to tackle a chapter. Or I'm going to, even if you're like, I'm going to ta tackle a section of a chapter today. Um, because I think if, you, if you're going to read this, I don't think you sit down and read the whole thing from cover to cover in one sitting, because you have to absorb this the information. I intended it for it to be a lot of information. So I think it's one I hope people come back to, you know, or, or um, refer to again and again. I, I'm buying it for my um, assistant director of social media, because I'm not giving her my copy. Okay. That's mine. <laughs> Although I'm going to have to have Jenny sign it next time I see you in person. I'm happy to do that. And thank you. Thank you for the support. That means a lot. I'm excited. So um, your book is about building flourishing online communities. So tell me a little bit about what you mean by that. Well, it's just, it's not just a following, you know, we're talking about an engaged, you know, and your, your fans, your engaged community. They're the community that like, they already love you. Mm. You know, you're just, you're just making a gathering space for them in another platform or area. And so, you know, these are your tried and true. They're your ambassadors. You know, if you're good to them, they'll be really good to you. Um, so yeah, that's what I mean. When you're wanting to build a community like that, what are some of the fundamentals? Like what are those brand ambassadors, those audiences really looking for? What do they come back for? What keeps them engaged? I, I, yeah, that's a great question. I think the thing is that you're continuing to provide value. You're continuing to provide content that they expect from you. Like they like you for a reason because you already resonate with them or, you know, they love your brand or they're an alumni or, you know, or their kids go to your school or, or they like your product. So they're already bought in. Um, and, and, but if you give them, you know, more, more of what they want, what they expect, more value information, I think that's what keeps them engaged and keeps them there and keeps, um, keep, keeps them growing loyalty and love for you. Some of the communities, the social communities that I've been most happy to be part of are ones where I get to have engagement with fellow fans. And how do you cultivate that in a community, especially in higher ed? How do you cultivate that sort of, we're, we're not just interacting with the brand, but with each other about the brand and around the brand? Yeah, that, you know, that's, it's something that I feel like happens in, and I don't mean to like bring up this word, but it, it happens organically. If you are, you know, creating content that really speaks to your your audience, like your audience sense of humor, mm -hmm. you know, your audience's love language. You know, I like, for instance, like, you know, we're, we're MIT. So our, our lo love language is numbers, right? So anytime mm -hmm. we can kind of fit in like, um, like a pun with a number or tell a joke, a math joke with a number or like Pi day is one of our favorite days, you know, like those are the things that you celebrate. And, and those are the things that like you're, your audience loves about you. And so when you know, when, and we love about, you know, we love about our community. So when you like really celebrate those things, you'll start to see like engagement with each other. Like they'll, they'll bring it in or, you know, they'll tell you like, you know, this, I love, you know, you're speaking to my nerd side or, right. you know, or, or like, you'll also notice that, you know, when other people ask questions about your, your community or your organization, your, um, on, on social, your uh, your audience will start helping to to actually answer those questions, and so it's like sort of that like that all encompassing like you know um, engagement. Like I think people really appreciate that, you know, um, yeah. And and it's just in in you know like I, I think I said this earlier, but it's sort of the same experience when you're in real life. Like if you're in our community in real life, it's, a, it feels the same 
um, there as it would, you know, on the platform. And I think that's really important. I, I love that. And I think about the institutions I've been at, um, Winston-Salem State, which is an HBCU in North Carolina. We had such a thriving online community there. Like our alumni would jump in and answer prospective student questions. They would correct each other. If somebody com- like started complaining about financial aid, they'd be like, hey, we don't complain on social media about our school. We love our school. And, you know, it was so vibrant and it was all around the sort of identity that that we had as an institution. And I've kind of struggled to create that same sort of sense of community at other institutions. And I'm curious about how did you figure out what's that commonality? You know, like you're talking about math or um, the love, your stuff. love language. Yeah. I think it, you know, I think it has to do um, with just, you know, the sense of, I think I started tapping into the sense of humor, right? Mm. And so there it's, it's a delicate balance, but it's almost like if you, you know, you, if you can share a laugh with someone because you think the same things are funny. So there are some things within your community that are almost inside jokes, right? Mm-hmm. There yeah. are like inside. And so you play on that a little bit. Um, but also it's not so hard to understand that anyone that's observing or not exactly that meshed into your community wouldn't understand it it's just it's funny you know or maybe it has like two layers like it's funny anyway but then if you get it if you know you know kind of right, like right so i think like um for me when i start at a new organization or you know like i do a lot of listening but i really try to learn like what the sense of humor is and 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 it was a little bit of a process because you know i'm you know, math is not my strong suit, but, um, but now that I've been here for so long, I, I could probably like recite seven digits of pi, you know, like I <laughs> right, just, cause, right. cause now I'm a part of the community, but now you just kind of like, know, like, you know, oh, that's so our community or that that's really funny. Like any sort of play on words, anything that you can recognize and jump on it. I think, um, is, you know, you just have to write, you have to learn the language and know the community to jump on those, um, those opportunities. For instance, like there was, I was having a a conversation with a colleague and, and this is just, you know, like I said, we're MIT, so we're nerdy this way, but she said, did you know, she said, did you know, today was the 20th, 20th day of the 20th week of, um, the 20th century, there was something with like, or maybe it was 21, but it was like 21, 21, 21. I said, are you kidding me? She's like, no, it's like someone mentioned that to me. It's the 21st week of the 21st month of the 21st. It was some, and I was like, if that's real, like I'm going to, I'm going to post that. And so like my colleagues and I were literally, we counted out, you know, <laughs> we were like, okay, is it, you know, and we like double checked with other people. Um, but, and it really was, and we didn't, it was nothing fancy. All we did was please enjoy this 21st day of the 21st week of the 21st year, you know, we, and, and it did gangbusters. It did great because we had enough foresight to say, wait, our com- that is so our community. They're going to love that. It doesn't have to be complex. You just have to capitalize on the moment. And it it did really, it did so well that, yeah, post. That, I think what you're ta- speaking to right now kind of ties back to our earlier conversation about the skill that it takes to manage a community because you can't just go and follow MIT and then just do what Jenny does. Like, You know, like I'm going to take what Jenny posted, I'm going to do that on my channels and it's going to accomplish the same thing, right? Like you have to understand and listen and know your community. community. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's why I think like having a book that kind of breaks down how you approach that, I think is more helpful than just, I'm just going to go follow MIT, which you should do, right? Because I think it's aspirational but it's not, it's not a template. It's not, right. it's not the thought process, you know, yeah. of how to, cause you know, not, I mean, not every community is like MIT and that's okay. And we pride ourselves in that too, <laughs> right, um, right. but you know, it's um, yeah, it's, it's just sort of the thought process and, and, and sort of formulas that have worked for me. Um, yeah. I really appreciate you saying that. I love it. In your book, you talk a little bit about the difference between strategies and tactics, which I think is something that 
eludes a lot of people. And you mentioned an aha moment when you really understood the difference between the two. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So, you know, early on uh, when I first got my job at MIT, and you know when you're you you get a new job and you're like anxious to prove yourself because you you feel like you need to jump in there and prove your worth and I had a one on one with my supervisor who is still my supervisor today and she's great I I love her like she's awesome. yeah we I love her um but she you know I was like oh you know I want to do this and I want to do this and I have plans to do this and I and and she just kind of went whoa 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 like that those are all great they're great ideas she's and she said. But those are all tactics. She's like, we need you to think strategically about our social media presence. And I just went, yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> and I, honest, I honestly, I don't remember, like, I just remember thinking, oh, my, that, yes, those are different, you know. Um, and I don't remember what I said in the rest of the conversation, but I, I, they I still work at MIT, so it couldn't have been bad, right? <laughs> so they kept me. Um, but yeah, it's it's a hard distinction to make. But, you know, like one, I always think, I'm always trying to think of better ways to explain this. And this is my most recent, like, way, example, is that, um, say you're playing chess, right? And um, you, you know, you can be really strategic from the start of how you're going to play your opponent. And that... And there are moves. They have they have names for their right. moves and everything. Um, but you start playing, and you 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 move, you gameplay, you observe, you watch your opponent, you react, you think about it. That's all strategy. That's all strategy. And your goal, right? Your aim is to win the game. Now, if you know how to play chess and you know how to move the pieces, right? Um, so. You could be moving pieces, but then you're not really playing with a goal in mind. You're mm -hmm. just moving the pieces. You're kind of playing, but you're not playing to win, mm -hmm. right? That's not yeah. – so it's, you know, strategy is like – like it just is like starting, reevaluating, you know, having a plan going in and knowing how to adjust in the middle. Like that's all – that's strategy, right? And so, and a lot of people are playing, they're posting, but they're not posting with a, with a, a, a goal in mind. They're just posting to be posting mm -hmm. and that's not ideal and that's not strategic. What does winning look like to you? Like, is that in chess? followers or is that, <laughs> right, right. I know. <laughs> like, um, I, I think it's, it's not necessarily large numbers, for me, it's engagements. Hmm. It, yeah. That really tells me people, like, the content itself is resonating with people. And so, um, ever you know, I've built a whole career on just stretching engagements, like hmm. observing engagements. What made this so good? You know, can I repeat it? Um, our audience really liked that. What can, you know, what else can we do in that space to do something similar? And so... Um, for me, it's engagements. I love that. I think that there's such a tendency to make it be follower growth. And follower growth is great. And and honestly, you should have follower growth simply by virtue of every year you're letting in hundreds or thousands of more exactly. people into your community, right? Mm -hmm. Or if you're only managing on the alumni side, maybe you're still hundreds to thousands of people every year are becoming alumni. Yeah. Um, so you should have growth. And I think that's worthy, but I like the idea of engagement being the goal because if it's growth, that's simply somebody has pushed a button and they may never intersect with you again at any point in time on that platform. And you don't even know, I mean, is it a bot? You right. Know? Is it even a member of your community or are they just following you to troll you? You know, mm -hmm. it's just like, you don't know. But, you know, one thing I've known is that if you stretch your engagements, like if you make your engagements grow, then your impressions and reach will follow. Mm -hmm. But the opposite is not true. Mm. You can grow your impressions, but then it doesn't necessarily do anything for your engagements. Mm. And the engagements are really, you know, what I, I call like a like or a share, a vote for that kind type of content. It's like they're saying I vote for this content because I really liked this because it made me take an action on it, you know? Yeah. So, that that's 
that's what my that's the metric that I always look to. Did you have to sell that to your leadership or was your leadership like, yep, nope, you're right on? And no, no. You know, it's 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 funny because I think when I first came into the position, leadership was really not very worried about social media, <laughs> you know, um, and, you know, I guess I didn't really make any big errors. So I think they just was they were just like, oh, you know, it's she's our social media manager has it. It's it's good. And so I think it was not really on their immediate radar. Um, so, you know, I didn't feel like there was like this, you know, like uh, people hovering over me or watching me. Um, but now that I'm like eight years in, I think I've built relationships and I've, I've built up credibility. And so that now when social media can be in such, such the forefront of crisis, you know, crisis and, um, you know, um, in communications, I think that I thankfully, you know, have, have, um, the respect, you know, and, and, yeah. and, you know, they, they, they believe in what I'm doing. And, um, so it's, it's not as difficult, you know, um, to yeah. make recommendations or, um, make suggestions. You've really earned your credibility and your, um, ability to be seen as the expert in the space that you work in. It sounds oh, like. I appreciate that. I, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, people you know, use that word or you know, tell me that I'm an expert, and I and I, I and I get it. I like I I I feel like I should own you know um, the experience that I've put into it and what I know. But really, it's you know I feel like what does that mean? It you know really what it is? It's it's I've learned from all of the years of doing it. Like I've made observations. I've learned. I've made you know I've made mistakes. And I've learned from them and I, you know, you just keep progressing and you know, social media is ever changing. So I'll continue to learn, you know, yeah. and if that makes me an expert that I'm thankful, that's wonderful. But I think it's more that, you know, I've just been in, you know, I, it, I guess it's my personality to just always be questioning and always be learning and observing. Well, I think that's how you become an expert is by, being willing to continue to learn and being willing to continue to question your expertise. And I, I do want to say we are a Barbie friendly podcast where as women, we embrace and say, thank you. I deserve this. That's like, I'm trying to get better about that when somebody's like, you know, you've, this is this thing that you did is great to not like be like, Oh, well, Oh, nah. Or, you know, yeah, what I mean? like, no, I think yeah. we should. Yes. I think we should take, you know, take our compliments, own your expertise. I think I even say that in my book, you know? Yeah, I, you do. <laughs> I do. Yeah, I do. So I think you should. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, 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 I appreciate it. I do. It, it can be, it can be hard. Like it, it it's, it's humbling. Hard. Yeah. We're socialized to sort of minimize when people say nice things about us. Right. Like right. it's like your hair looks so great. Like, oh, I just, you know, it was my stylist or, you know what I mean? Like, yes, we just, we I don't do. Own, we don't own it. Um, that could be an, another podcast right? conversation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Mm -hmm. I, feel, I, I, I feel like I need to get a group of ladies on the podcast to talk about like how to be a lady in leadership. I'm here for it. Yeah. yeah. I'm here for it. It's definitely, definitely. Um, there's still a lot of. Uh, gendered expectations and um, sexism and stuff like that, that you still face, um, unfortunately. And then that when you layer in intersectionality and okay, that's not what this episode's about, but you know, it gets, it gets complicated. <laughs> we could go on. Yeah. Yes. So um, what advice do you have for social media strategists when they're taking a look at some of the new platforms? Like we talked about earlier, you know, Google plus, RIP, you know, all the platforms that no longer exist. How, how do you decide when you're going to jump on something or not? Yeah. You know, I, I think it's important to not be so reactive. You know, I, I've never heard anyone say like, 
oh, are you following so-and-so? They're the first ones on this. Right. <laughs> you know, it's always like, are you following so-and-so? They're like killing it on this platform or they're so funny or I learned so much from them. It's never because they're the first or they're yeah. the first ones. You don't get a recommendation. because. So I think it's really important to observe, you know, and 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 learn, right? And is is your audience even on that platform is the audience mm. you seek to reach on that platform do you have even if it if yes do you have the resources to ma manage another platform or um does the content you currently have does it is it a fit for the new you know new platform cuz you know when when vertical videos came out that was a whole nother thing you know if if you're still using like 16 9 videos for tiktok then you're fitting you're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole right <laughs> yeah. you're, you're not doing it right so i think that these are there's a lot of discovery work that i think doesn't always get done um that's really important to do before you actually hit you know create new account now there is an argument for creating the account to hold your name Mm -hmm. Right. But then you don't have to be active in it immediately. Just say, you know, this is the official account, but we're not active in it right now. Yeah. You know, <laughs> follow us on X, Y, and Z, you know? So no one's saying that you have to be active immediately. I think in order to really do it well, you know, it takes resources. It takes, it takes learning. It takes um, evaluation. It takes, it takes some discovery work. What's your take on um, universities using TikTok and it, like in my state, Virginia, we are banned from using right. TikTok as an institution. What are your thoughts around that? I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> I mean, I, I have a lot of thoughts on, around that. I, um, but I, I think that TikTok is not the uh, only offender or, 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 you know, if, if there are, I, I would say there are other applications and platforms that are that are scouring your information for the same information is what yeah I, I will say you know yeah. it, it's I will say it's not just TikTok so it's too it's too bad but you know TikTok it can be an asset you know if if and I've seen a lot of universities use it really well yeah well I, I what makes me nervous about TikTok is I know our students are using it and they're sharing things on it and some of it is not particularly flattering. Um, you know, they're, they're making something funny, but they're making fun of something that's like not a, a positive reflection of the university. And there's no space for us to be on there with a different narrative, because we're not allowed to be on it. So it's not it's like if you search the hashtag or whatever, you're getting um, this user generated content, and there's nothing institutionally created. I would argue that there are folks um, that are students or alumni that are creating, that are saying positive things about the, the university. I mean, that's going to be any platform. There's going to be naysayers on every platform, but I, I would be willing to bet that there are those that are in your corner creating good content that's, for that's you. That's very likely true. We, we can't even use TikTok on campus so we can't even like look and see what's out there wow. we can do that at home or I guess I don't think we're even supposed to technically use it if we're getting the wow. phone stipends and stuff so it's it's pretty restrictive here but yeah I, it's just it's a unique challenge I think of for pri or public institutions where we're sort of hampered in that way but. in specific regions yeah. yeah but i always tell people you don't have to be in all of the platforms you know yeah. just you know be make a mark in the platforms that you're in you know like be really great in the platforms that you're in because that that content gets shared you know like i always say that good like great content jumps platforms and what mm. i mean by that is that you know how many times have you seen tweets or ex posts on instagram how many yeah. times have you seen tiktoks on reels you know yeah. how many times have you seen like 
you know, YouTube videos on, on like Facebook or LinkedIn. So yeah. if the content is good, it's going to get shared. It doesn't matter. Like people will DM you, people DM me, you know, the, um, in videos and, and content. So it gets shared. So if the content, if your content is really great, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, on whatever platform, your audience will spread it and share it for you. That's a really good point. I mean, there's so many TikToks that I see of tweets, like it's people right, sharing right, tweets on, right. on TikTok. I'm, I refuse to call it X. Um, <laughs> I, just, I hear you. I just can't. Um, but I think one of the things that you talk about a little bit in your book, but that I, I think is super important is that authenticity piece. I think sometimes um, leaders can push for like creating this very polished, not real um, picture of, of your institution on social media. Why is authenticity so important? Because that's how you attract your real fans, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, T Taylor Swift fans will tell you in an instant if it's like a real cardigan or a fake, you know, or if it's a, <laughs> it's a <laughs> knockoff, right? Like the, your real fans or your tried and true members of your community will know when you're being you and know when you're putting out like you know, like a, sort of a fake side of you, you yeah. know, I, you know, one thing that has worked really well in those instances is that if you show what your competitors are doing, particularly everyone has a competitor or yep. a, pe a peer, you know, and then if you say like, gosh, you know, this really, um, you know, organic video by our competitor did really well, you know, it got like thousands of, you know, you know, likes or what. And so sometimes if you kind of like bring out that competitive side in leadership, then then um, it helps to make your case for you. And then they'll and, and you can just say, you know, it wouldn't take us a lot of money to do something similar. You know, and our in and our, our our audience, you know, we have the same audience, and they they they're showing that they like that. They think we could do something similar. We could do it better, you know. And um, sometimes that speaks to their competitive side, and you'll be surprised at what you can, you know, get approved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you just kind of sh you know make a plea to their competitive side, you know. Yeah, in my twenty years, I feel like. I've had so many conversations where the question has been like, well, who else is doing it? And, and but that's important. You, yeah. 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 Like who else has this? Who else is doing that? Who else has approached this? It's funny when you, you talk about um, approvals, I think we're both friends with J.S. Stancil and yeah. um, he often posts memes about like what the post looked like before legal got a hold of it. And I'm curious about how much of your content is pre-approved or that you do escalate up for review? I There are only certain topics that I have to have approval on, but um, everything else is like, it's, I'm the pr approver. Um, so almost 100% of our content, you know, but there are times where it, in times of crisis, <laughs> yeah, I think most mostly that it's, it is reviewed and we go over it with a number of people. Um, and, and there, are, there are times when legal does need to brought, be brought in, but it's only been a few times at, in my experience. So you, you end up with um, something that's more true to what your vision and your strategy is because you're able to kind of be that approver for it. Yes. So I would say most of the time, yes. And I I realize it's not always the case and I feel very, very fortunate. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, I think your eight and a half years or whatever, I'm sure they can see that you have excellent judgment and that you're I, not. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, it helps. Um, so you have a whole section in the book on mental health and there's an earlier episode, and I wish I could remember which one it was done for me to not make note, but I spoke with Ali Kunzi, who has done a bunch of research into the mental health of social media managers, specifically in higher ed. And I'm curious about your observations on the, that topic and your thoughts on how social media managers and online community managers can really protect their peace. Yeah. So I am convinced if you have, if you have any 
if you spend any time or a decent amount of time in this profession, that you will encounter burnout, you know? Um, and I think a lot of times we don't even recognize it that mm. we we do. Like I I did and I did not recognize it in me. And it 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 um it got worse. You know, mm. it went beyond burnout. And um I think that's when um it's past, but when you think, oh my gosh, like, so a lot of times when you think, oh my gosh, I'm really at my wits end, then you're beyond burnout. You're not mm. just experiencing burnout. And I don't think we recognize that. So I think it's really important to understand. I mean, if there's a clinical definition of what burnout is. It's really under, uh, important to understand what it is. And I think that it's really important to create boundaries. Like I know Social media is a 24-7 industry. There are times when, you know, it we do need to be on it a little bit longer or, you know, need to check on it more. But I think for the most part, that is not an everyday thing. And you really do have to, I think, make a conscious effort of like, if you're done at five, be done at five, and then try to do something that's not related to the job. You know, like, right. I know it's really easy for us to hop into our personal accounts then, like, just at least for an hour or two, you know, just like just try to do something that's totally unrelated <laughs> to yeah. social media go um touch go outside touch the grass you know right. but uh I, I just think it's it's important it's important um for your health it's important because it'll it'll affect your you and your personal life and so that's why it's really like boundaries are really important and it's hard I realize it but it, I think that when you set boundaries for yourself other people generally tend to respect them and I really hope for the leaders listening that you listen if you have staff members who are saying, I need a break or something's not right with me. Um, I, I talked to someone um, maybe about a year ago who was saying that they were just so burned out and so tired and they were just going to quit. And I encouraged them to talk to their supervisor first to see if there was an opportunity to kind of maybe re- uh, structure their role or um, cre create an opportunity to maybe take a break from what they were doing for a little while. And they did talk to the supervisor and their supervisor so valued them that they were like, absolutely, we can, we can make this work. Yeah. And I just think about that was an opportunity for that person. So they didn't just quit their job and walk off into the night. They had an opportunity to try to fix the situation. Yeah. And I think that communication is really important from both sides, you know, from the, the manager as well as the supervisor. I think that's really, and if, you know, if that person was saying, I, I could, I could quit tomorrow or I want to quit now, then that's way beyond burnout. I mean, the, yeah. they've, been, they've been feeling it for a while and have just kept it inside. And so that's why I just, I just urge all social media managers to just look up or, you know, I think I have the symptoms in my book. I do have the symptoms in my book. I talk about, you know, just really get familiar with it. And if you start to feel yourself, you know, like experiencing any of them, it's really, it's really important to recognize and just kind of take steps for your, your wellness. You know, I do understand that there are times where you have to work longer hours we all do it's mm -hmm. just it just happens and it's part of it's part of the um, industry as well but you know I think sometimes what maybe leaders don't understand super is that you know when we're looking at like net like this like comments or the toxic comments it's like you're con you know you're constantly being told things like like shame on you, shame on you, or how dare you, like things like over and over and over again, you know? So, yeah. and that get, that wears on you. Like, even if it's, you know, it's really important to compartmentalize and keep it separate, but you know, it's just reading negative things that are in like the pronoun, like you, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it can get hard after a while. And so, um, you know, I think that's something that, you know, it's important for supervisors to recognize, you know, yeah. um, and also it's, I think it's important for social media managers to know, like, you don't have to read every single, every single comment. Like if, if you scroll through, you kind of get it, you know? Right. Yeah. So don't, don't get stuck in the muck, you know? And, um, and there are, there are times where there are certain, you know, 
posts that are critical, that are important, you know, um, to, to flag or to recognize, but uh, the vast majority of them is just, it's just garbage, you know? Yeah. I think that's, that's real wisdom. And I think, I think about back, I can't remember how many years ago, like inside higher ed used to have comments on their stories and sometimes it would be dozens of comments of people just going at each other. And I just thought like, what is the value that this is providing to the world? And the reporter has to go and look at these and that somebody has to manage this community and try to make sure that nobody's like violating the community standards. I think it was so good when they just said, there's no value here. I, I mean, I don't know if that's exactly how they said it, but like, this has more negative value than it doesn't. And I think sometimes that sort of sc doom scrolling those negative comments, like when it's not about you and you're on the outside, like sometimes I, I honestly sat in like ate popcorn and read people <laughs> you know, fighting <laughs> with know. each other in the yeah. comments. But if there's no value to be gained from going through those comments, why? Yeah. And a lot of times it veers off of what the, what the yes. you know, article was about in the first place. Yes. Right. So yeah. wh what is that about? Right. So what one piece of advice would you give to someone who admires your work, who admires the work you're doing at MIT? What one bottom line piece of advice does Jenny Lee Fowler have for people? I mean, oh gosh. I, I, you know, I would say always be curious, you know, just approach everything with curiosity. Um, new platform, be curious did something do well? Be curious, you know, is, are you getting criticized? Be curious, try, try to start with curiosity, be curious, right? And I would also um, say, don't be reactive. Just take a beat, no matter what it is, you know, just, it might be good, it might be bad, it might be new, you know, just take a beat. And that took me a while to learn, because my, I, I'm, I lead with emotions. So I, you know, I always have a emotional react, you know, reaction. Um, but everything like now, like, I'm just like, okay, you know, let's, I, that made me feel a certain way when I first read it. Let me go back and read it again. <laughs> let me respond to it later, or let me just think about how we need to handle this, you know? So I think you just give, give yourself some time because I think sometimes social media feels so fast, 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 but you have time, you have time, you know, um, it's okay. Um, so that, I think that's what I would say. I think that's excellent advice for everyone about everything. <laughs> you know, like we get the, we get those emails where we start to write like per my last email. Oh yes. You know, like, <laughs> yes. Like just, just give yourself a minute. Like just, just, I try not to respond. I try to walk away. I try to touch grass before I respond to stuff that so riles good. me up. Such good. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's good to take a beat. Jenny, do you have anything else exciting ahead for you? Yes, Jamie. I am joining the Enrollify podcast network of Yay! creators. Yay. So I um, will be, I don't know, would we call ourselves Enrollify sisters? I Is guess. Yeah. It's like but a sorority now. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so, yeah, I'm um, going to be taking on confessions of a higher ed social media manager. Yay. So yeah, I'm super excited. I, I was dying to tell you. <laughs> I'm so happy. It, I, I, I was thinking as we were talking, I'm like, we need a deep dive. Like she needs to do a podcast because like you could do a deep dive on every topic in this book. Could be a whole oh, episode. I appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited. When does your you. first episode launch? I think I don't I want I don't want to say a date and be wrong. It's it's later this month. Oh, wow. Yeah. So still in January. Yeah. And yeah. Awesome. Do you have like your whole show planned out what you're going to do with every episode and all of that yet? Not every. Because <laughs> <laughs> everything happens faster than you think. Yeah. You know, yeah. this is coming up, um, it's sneaking up on me very quickly. But I do have my first guest planned. Um, uh, I think I'm going to be taking a lot of the similar for format as this one. I'm going to have guests on and we'll talk about very specific topics related to social media um and hopefully you know it'll resonate and it, hopefully it'll be fun like this and um yeah i'm super excited you're gonna do great i bet your news anchor background is gonna help you do a great job 
with I appreciate it. it comes it comes back it's funny it's it's like a um you know it it's like riding a bicycle it just you just remember and it comes back to you yeah I find that too. I haven't been a journalist for like 22 years and I find like those skills of how you get people to open up and and talk and convey information that it's like riding a bike mm -hmm. it, yeah mm -hmm. I love it I love it. I'm so happy for you. So if people want to find you, uh, where can they look for you? Yeah, I'm in LinkedIn in X, my, or Twitter, my Twitter X, my um, DMs are open. Um, I'm on Instagram too, but you know, I, I show more of my mom's side. It's more oh. of like my personal side. And so oh. if that's interesting to you, then you can find me there. <laughs> are you Jenny Lee Fowler on all yes. the platforms? Okay. Yeah. Um, and on, except on Twitter, it's at the Jenny Lee, because oh, nice. I had that before I was married. So, yeah. You're the Jenny Lee. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny Lee was already taken. So I just make it the I love it. Like Jenny Petty is I am Jenny Petty. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I love it. It's perfect. Awesome. Well, um, listeners, as always, you know, you can find me on LinkedIn, Jamie Hunt, J-A-I-M-E. I'm back and forth on Twitter. I I wish I could quit it, but I just can't. It's I just oh, it was my favorite social platform. Um, so I'm sad. I feel the same way, Jamie. I feel the same way. And it was my it favorite. Just... I feel like you and I like connected on on yes. Twitter before it was X. Yeah. And the community there was so tremendous. Oh, so good. I I feel like they got me through the pandemic. To tell yes. you the truth. Yeah. Yeah. So 100. I'm just, I'm not ready. I'm still no. not letting it go. <laughs> I, I, I quit for about a month and then I came back and we'll see. Um, Elon, Elon. Um, I'm also on TikTok, um, the higher ed CMO there. And um, you can find me there. And Jamie Hunt, I am C on Twitter, J-A-I-M-E-H-U-N-T-I-M-C. Um if you feel so inclined, use the hashtag higher ed CMO if you want to have any conversation about the episode. But until then, let's go bust some silos. Confessions of a Higher Ed CMO is part of the Enrollify Podcast Network. If you like this podcast, chances are you'll like other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast network is growing by the month. We've got a plethora of marketing, enrollment, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks, all designed to empower you to be a better higher ed professional. Our shows help higher ed marketers and admissions professionals find their next big idea and feature a selection of the industry best as your host. Learn from Mallory Wilsey, Seth O'Dell, Jenny Lee Fowler, Eddie Francis, and so many other of your favorite leaders in higher ed. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the leading AI-powered all-in-one student engagement platform, helping institutions create meaningful, personalized, and engaging interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com.